Hello! Good to see you again! I've been reading through. I'm going to start trying to reply to a lot of things uh, this week. Um, if I haven't already by the time I put this video out on Wednesday. Um, so you should see some of my replies um, starting to pop up, if not already popped up. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I should say as a reminder. Nothing's coming to me yet. If I think of something, I'll pop it out in the reminder or whatnot. But anyway, so I'm back, and I'm back with Monty this time. As you can see, here he is. Hello, Monty. He's about to go through a shed, so he's a bit quiet today. That's why his nose is buried in my neck, and he's just, like, sleeping around. So, like I said, I've had him for about, oh, God, 18 years, 17 years. I've had him for quite a long time. And uh, he's a ball python, which is uh, naturally found in Africa. And um, he's a bit of a silly guy. He's been helping me teach for years. Um, my students usually love to hug him while they're in class, while I'm teaching. Actually, he is literally almost a therapy snake. If there was a way to get uh, snakes um, licensed for therapy, he definitely wouldn't be the, one of the first ones up. He's uh, been helping students for uh, my students for as long as I've been teaching. So. He's, he's a good boy. He's, he's a bit of a dork. Uh, but um, he's about to shed, so he's a bit shy right now. Sometimes he, he moves around, and sometimes he uh, moves the uh, slides on me while I'm in the middle of a rant on something. So. so anyway, so there's Monty. Say hi, Monty. Ah, hi, Monty. So there we go. So let's go ahead, and if you've survived Chapter 2... Welcome to chapter three, which is pretty much running through biology in a nutshell, which is, like I said, two is a lot. Uh, if you haven't already noticed, chapter two is quite a lot of information thrown at you. Um, and we kind of throw these things at you, uh, unfortunately, because we assume, and I, I, I hate that we assume this, that uh, you know, you've had some biology in your past in some form or fashion, and some people haven't had it since um, high school, which is, uh, so this is kind of like a, a very fast way to remind you of hopefully everything you learned in biology, or if not, the, yeah, this is why I find a lot of people panic at chapter two, three, and four, um, because we're hitting concepts that um, in any other biology class we'd be digging deeper into and having a longer time for you to understand it, but we're kind of like drive-by uh, sciencing you with these three chapters before we move on to the, you know, the, the meat, the meat, which is, um, or if you're a vegetarian, the starch of um, when you get to uh, chapter five. So honestly, remember, if you can survive chapters two, three, and four, you've got this course pretty much. You're, you're good to go. You'll live through the rest of the semester, I assure you. It's, these three are, are, are quite the hump to throw in your face uh, as you first come into this class. So I feel you. If you're feeling, oh, yeah, it's okay. It's settled down by chapter five, hopefully. Theoretically, maybe. I hope so. Anyway, if, if not, let me know. Remember, I am open for, um, you know, uh, tutoring and whatnot. And do, you know, contact the, uh, uh, blah, 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 the student services. They can also do that stuff, too. So, um, although I have a funny feeling, they'll just go, hey, can you tutor so-and-so? And I'll be like, hey, yeah, I can do that. So, anyway. So, there you go. So, let's go ahead and start talking about Chapter 3, which is all about cells. Which is good, because what are we made of? We're made of cells. And I found this on uh, Facebook the other day, and I thought it was way too perfect. <laughs> I like It points out only the mitochondria is correct. Everything else, organic papaya, red grape, jello, penne pasta, fruit roll-ups. Excellent. Love it. All right, what do we got? So, remember, the cell is the basic unit of living organisms that is in itself alive. And it's actually a very funny history story about how that comes about, uh, how we figured this out, because we used to think a whole bunch of strange things before we ever figured out, oh yeah, we're all made of cells. Everything that's alive, that's large, is made of cells. Except for this one algae that's literally a single-celled organism. He's a weirdo. 
There's always a weirdo. Like I said, uh, hopefully I mentioned it earlier, in science there's always a but. Yeah, it's like we have rules of thumb, but there's always somebody who breaks that rule because biology just doesn't want to play by the rules. Life wants to do what it wants uh, within reason with chemistry. So we have a ton of different types of cells, so many different types of cells that we actually kind of break them down into larger groups. And we're going to go into a lot of them as we go through this entire course. So you're going to be introduced to a lot of these guys up close and friendly, like the red blood cell, the white blood cell, uh, all the uh, epithelial cells, bone cells, which come in four flavors. And we'll talk about them when we talk about the skeleton, ovum and sperm cells, which are actually different from the rest of your cells. So, and we'll get into that in a minute. These are gametes because they're different from all the rest of your cells because they're only used for reproduction. So when we talk about gametes, which are, you know, eggs and sperm, um, that's where just, we're just literally, when anybody says gametes, it's the sex cells. That's it. That's all there is. All the other cells in your body are known as somatic cells. And we're going to be primarily talking about somatic cells in general in this chapter. So these guys get their own chapter later, uh, like next semester later. Um, but keep in mind, these are the only two that are kind of like outliers right now. And we're not going to talk about them until way later. The rest of these guys are known as somatic cells. Um, and this is a neuron. Neurons are crazy. And we'll get into just how crazy these guys really are when we start talking about the nervous system. I mean, the nervous system literally gets three chapters at the end of this semester. We're going to be hitting it a little too fast. Again, something I wish we could delve more into because there's so many fascinating stories um, about how we discovered the things we did. And I'm going to only touch on a few when we get there. So now one thing we got to understand is that there's two major different types of cells. One that has nothing to do with us, sort of, and the other one that we're completely made up of. And so the first one is the prokaryote. Pro means first, carry means kernel. And um, yeah, you might be going kernel. Well, if you look inside a cell, you kind of see the nucleus and they consider that a kernel um, or the kernel of life or something like that. I'm sure some philosopher is getting philosophied out there about this, but anyway. so. Um, there are a group of organisms that lack uh, a cell nucleus or any membrane organelles. These guys are tiny and have been around longer than we've been on the planet. These are almost, you can consider the first life forms ever on this planet. And if you want to get into, uh, you know, uh, astronomy territory, there are a bunch that think, you know, possibly some of the first bacteria that showed up on Earth possibly could have been rejects kicked off of Mars. But I'm not going there right now. I just threw it out there because I thought it was weird. And you know me, I like talking about strange things. So anyway, eukaryote is what we are. We are made up of eukaryotic cells. All of the eukaryotic cells uh, in our body, excuse me, all of the cells are eukaryotic. Uh, we do have prokaryotes living in us, but they are not a part of us. We have ones that live in our gut. That's our gut bacteria. They help us break things down, and they get a cut of the food in turn for us helping down, uh, helping uh, uh, digest uh, some things that we can't digest alone. So gut bacteria, we love them. They're the good guys. We like them. Um, unfortunately, bad guys of these can get into us and make us sick, and that's why we have to use antibiotics. Now, there is a third outlier. Remember when I said biology has kind of rules of thumb and then there's a but? Yeah, the but is viruses. Viruses are neither a prokaryote or a eukaryote. And a lot of people get them confused. Please don't. I'm actually going to show you a video in a minute that shows you the size difference between these guys. And it's astronomical because you can't really look at a book pictures like these two right here. This should be 100 times bigger than this. This thing's a tiny. However, the tiniest, tiniest little creepers are the viruses, and they're not really considered alive because they're not a cell. And on top of that, they infect cells to reproduce, so they can't even reproduce on their own, uh, which is something prokaryotes and eukaryotes can do just fine, or else we wouldn't be here. So prokaryotes, like I said, there's the good, the bad, and the okay. They have nothing to do with us, and we're fine with that. 
And the bad, unfortunately, that's where we have to use the antibacterial stuff to kind of kill it off. But unfortunately, but it's interesting because we've actually kind of got clever and we might have a way to use viruses against them because even before us, there's been a war waged on this planet since the dawn of life. And that's actually been between the prokaryotes and viruses. They hate each other. They're constantly uh, changing, evolving to destroy each other. And we're just now understanding this war and understanding that, hey, if we get a bacteria that's resistant to antibacterial drugs, maybe we can hit them with a virus that has nothing to do on us. Um, and then he dies to that virus. And we've actually already done that uh, with one person and he survived. We actually cured somebody with the virus of a huge uh, bacterial infection that could not be fought. So uh, with drugs, it was like completely resistant to any drugs we had. And we actually cured a guy with a virus that has nothing to do with humans and was just like, yeah, and saw these guys and went after them. Because viruses and bacteria, they don't like each other. Yep. It's kind of like Yankees and, 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 and Red Sox fans. Except, honestly, I think we begrudgingly, as a Yankees fan, I like to say, I think we begrudgingly like each other. Because if somebody else walks up, we'd probably get annoyed at them. Of course, nobody likes Yankees fans, I guess. Oh, well. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, that's fine. So, without further ado... Like I said, I like to try and show you, and hopefully YouTube doesn't like ding me on this. Um, I'm gonna try and mute it as it plays, but I'd like to talk about, uh, you know, the different, the size differences of, of viruses versus you know like things like bacteria, because we don't really think about it in that that form right now. I mean, like this is this is the Black Death. I know it's a fuzzy version with the face, but. Um, this actually is way, way bigger than my coronavirus right here. But, you know, in fuzzy terms, it's just easier to show them, you know, at a certain size. So that's why we're going to talk about, like, for instance, again, my buddy, T4 bacteriophage, which is one of our favorite uh, viruses to play with in the lab. He's, he doesn't care about us at all. He only likes bacteria, that's why he's called a bacteriophage, bacteria for, you know, bacteria and phage for to eat. So we like these guys because we mess with them in the lab all the time. Yee. And then, you know, a neuron. I only have one brain cell. It happens. All right, so let's go ahead while I'm playing with my toys. Let's go over this. So. I said I'm going to mute it so that way it's not up in our faces. So we're gonna start with the rhinovirus. This actually causes colds. And then we're gonna to move to polio. Polio almost completely devastated us. Uh, if it wasn't for the polio vaccine, we'd still be hanging out. This is the flu. Gee, doesn't he look similar to, yeah, sort of. They're actually in two different family strains. This is rabies that looks like an angry pickle. Here's my buddy, the T4 bacteriophage I was just talking about. We really like messing with him. This is what smallpox looks like. It looks like a scrunchy raisin. Now, that was all viruses. We're jumping to prokaryotes. Look at the size difference. That's Staphylococcus. Yeah, that causes staph. Look at the size difference. It's insane. Lactobacillus. This actually hangs out and helps us digest milk. E. coli. He's another friend of ours that we really enjoy uh, using in the lab. We've used E. coli to understand quite a few things about bacteria. So he looks gnarly, but he's actually... If there's an E. coli, you know, outburst in a, in a restaurant because of uncleanly practices, he's bad. Trust me, he's bad. But for the most part, in a lab, we like messing with him. I've actually genetically engineered some E. coli back in my uh, grad days. So I'm just saying, we like messing with him in labs. Now, in a restaurant, bad. In a lab, good. Now we're, now we're jumping into eukaryotes. Here's a red blood cell. Look at the size difference. Again, you can't even see the viruses down here. I mean, that's insane. So again, I'm showing you this so you can kind of wrap your head around somewhat what's going on, the sizes when I'm talking about these things. So, I mean, just check out, check that out. It's insane. So moving on. Something just donked at me, and I don't know what. There's baker's yeast. 
This is a skin cell coming up. Look at that. Look at the size difference. Here's a human sperm. Now we're jumping to pollen, which is plant sperm, by the way. And here's a neuron, just one neuron. Look at the size difference between a skin cell and one of our neurons. And here's an egg cell. Eggs are big compared to sperm. Here's a euglena. These are the ones that are, they, they live single-celled lives. They're funny. Uh, diatoms are gorgeous. If you ever want a fun time on, um, if you ever want a fun time on, uh, hold on, using all three of my brain cells. Um, yeah, they have three. No, I have one. Anyway, uh, so diatoms, Google them sometime. They're gorgeous. They're just absolutely pretty. They actually make silica shells. Very pretty. Paramecium's. Our friend the amoeba. Actually, amoebas hate us. They give us really sick if they, we drink contaminated water. So even though they're fun under a microscope, they are not fun in the water. Uh, there's a water bear. Here's a frog egg. And there's a human hair in the back. We can't even see the viruses anymore. So just think about that. So next time you see your car covered in pollen, which is often right now, imagine your brain cells are actually bigger than that, which is probably a good thing. But anyway, that's kind of what I wanted to show you. Um, I just wanted to give you an idea of the size and scale of these things, so that way you're not going, yeah, a virus is the same thing as a bacteria, which I've heard, heard out of people's mouths, which makes me go, no, please don't hurt me. Anyway. No, we go next. 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 Thank you. Let me just check something real quick, because something went donk, and I hope it's not OBS. Nope, looks like we're still going. Okay, I think I figured it out. Sorry about that. Back to slide. All right, so. All right, so. Since all cells can be really different from each other, as I just showed you, I mean, look from the red blood cell to the neuron, and I mean, it, it, the, the red blood cell was teeny weeny compared to a neuron, which was a big boy. Um, so let us go ahead and look at some general things that are the same between all cells, whether they're tiny like a red blood cell or big like a neuron. And that is all cells have three major parts, and that is the cell membrane, the cytoplasm and the nucleus. Now the cell membrane, so we're gonna start there. Remember when I was talking about in chapter two, the lipids and how lipids are not soluble in water and how this is gonna play a big part in uh, cell, basically the skin of the cell because we don't want our cells to dissolve in water. That would be bad, especially since, you know, uh, hopefully, like me, you enjoy, you know, cleaning up in the shower or just standing under the blistering hot water while your husband questions, you know, where you came from. Um, because I like my showers hot and my husband can't take it, but anyway, whatever. So anyway, all cells have a cell membrane. All cells. End of story. That's one of the major things that makes a cell a cell. Now, it's made up of phospholipids. So these are a type of lipid that basically have a head and I'm just circling it right here, and two tails. Remember I mentioned in the last chapter, lipids usually uh, have tails. Like butter has a, a glycerin head and he has three tails. That's basically how the molecular structure of butter looks. So butter's got three tails. These guys, these phospholipids have two tails. And these tails and its head talk about a bipolar creature, or not really, a molecule, excuse me. How far behind? Anyway. Um, and that's the thing that's actually kind of crazy. The heads love water, so they're called hydrophilic, which philia means to love. And their tails, um, their twin tails, are hydrophobic. They hate water. So when you throw phospholipids, and you can do this in a lab, this is the thing that's absolutely insane. We have made protocells. Uh, very easily in the lab, and that's just literally taking handfuls, well, not exactly handfuls, but uh, beakerfuls of phospholipids and you dump them in water and instantaneously what they'll do is they'll shove their heads towards the water and their tails away from the water and they'll make these bubbles. And sometimes 
More often than not, they'll make a double bubble. And that was the beginning of the cell, pretty much. We made an internal environment that's separate from the outer, uh, external environment. Outernal, whoa. Anyway, so as you can see right here, uh, all the tails are in the inside and the heads are on the outside. So we external environment outside the cell, internal environment we can control, AKA life. So we're organized. And um, this kind of controls what comes in and out of the cell. Now you'll also notice these yellow things right here with the, the kinky tail coming off. These are cholesterols. So yes, we actually do need cholesterol to actually stiffen up um, the cell membrane. So yeah, you actually do need cholesterol. That's why there's like several, uh, there's three different types we like to talk to, uh, talk about, excuse me, not talk to. Hello, cholesterol. Anyway, um, and uh, so therefore it stiffens it up. And we need that in certain places, especially like, for instance, our nervous system. Our brain is very high in cholesterol because these, these uh, you know, these brain cells right here, our neurons, they have to keep this shape. If they don't keep this shape, they don't, they can't do their job. So they're very high in cholesterol because they don't really have a skeleton or anything. Granted, there's a cell skeleton that does happen. But one of the major things is having a stiffer uh, cell membrane than, say, a red blood cell, which is designed to bounce around inside your circulatory system. So there's a reason why that's round and looks kind of like, you know, an um, inner tube that you would go to a park with and ride down the scary water rides with your son while we both scream, which is because he likes that. Anyway, so now sticking through these, and you're going to see this in a video I'm going to show you in a minute. Sticking through these is a whole bunch of proteins, and there's different types. These are called transmembranic proteins. and this is a receptor protein for hormones. We'll talk about him later when we talk about hormones. This is a channel protein. He le he's like a nightclub bouncer, but basically all of these guys in different ways. And we're going to go over their differentness later. Usually when we hit on them, I just, you know, say, oh, this is an ion channel gate. So don't panic about knowing what each one does right now. Okay. Just know that there's protein sticking out and they act like nightclub bouncers. They, they're the ones that sit there and say, okay, sodium, you are allowed in, come on in. And then, no, no, potassium, you must stay out. So they're selective or selectively permeable. So they let some things in and keep other things out, um, if only briefly. And that's actually how your muscles and your nervous system work. So we'll talk about these channel gates later, these proteins. Also, there's proteins called peripheral proteins that stick out everywhere. This comes into play with our immune system and our, uh, our, uh, yeah, our blood types a little later. So these guys sticking out um, play a whole bunch of different roles and they're called peripheral proteins. So the ones sticking through transmembranic proteins, and like I said, there's a bazillion different types and we're gonna hit them as we go along in, in this course. So don't sit there and go, I gotta memorize them all. No, don't. Um, and the peripheral proteins, which are sticking out, which have all sorts of different uh, various things, but they're also, I like to think of them as like a flag. In other words, it's a way for cells to tell who belongs to who. Um, it's how your body knows self, which is a major important part of the immune system, which you talk about next semester. It's kind of like why COVID has these sticky outy bits. These are actually proteins and some viruses have them and some viruses don't, these sticky outy bits. They're called antigens. Again, don't panic if you don't remember that later, but they're basically proteins that stick out. And this is basically how the world of cells communicate with the one way of how they communicate with each other is uh, like a white blood cell, which is like a guardian comes up and goes up, up, up and checks the protein flag sticking out and goes up. Oh, yep. You belong here. Cool. Cool. You pass. And then he comes up to like, for instance, this, you know, guy trying to hide who's not from your body. And then the immune system goes, these aren't our flags, eat him. And they destroy him. So that's, Immune system in a nutshell, trust me, there's more nuances to that and we'll get to that next semester, actually almost right in the beginning of the next semester. So just know proteins sticking out have a variety of different purposes, one of which is so the body knows itself and so the immune system doesn't kill you. The, because your immune system, if it goes off, can accidentally kill you. And by accidentally, I mean not really. Anyway, so 
So proteins are all over the place. So like I said, the ones that go through transmembranic, the ones that stick out peripheral. And remember, cell membrane is selectively permeable. There is one thing we're gonna talk about that in the next chapter that the cell membrane has no control over, and that's water. So that is happening in chapter four. We're gonna talk more about that later in chapter four. I'm just introducing you to the cell membrane and its major components today, which is the phospholipids, which make it up and don't, you know, dissolve in water that are, uh, have a hydrophilic head and hydrophobic tails, which is why they uh, just naturally, because of the presence of water, make this double layer. Um, cholesterol, to stiffen it up, so that way if they need to maintain a certain shape, like neuron, they have a lot of cholesterol. So don't eat brains, they're full of cholesterol. Um, actually, you shouldn't <laughs> eat brains for a lot of different reasons. Silly zombies. Uh, the transmitic branded proteins that are like nightclub bouncers sticking through, and the peripheral proteins which are sticking out. And you're gonna see this in a video I love to use constantly. Now, let's talk about the cytoplasm. This is where all the fun is happening in the cell, where all the organelles are hanging out and what all the organelles do and all this insanity. Like I said, I'm going over this as an overview. I am not going to go crazy uh, because like I said, this is like a drive-by biology here, which is why a lot of people find it difficult if they haven't hung out in biology. So may I highly recommend watching a lot of crash courses if you need a, a jump start into uh, what each one of these guys do. I'm gonna touch on them in this lecture, but after that, I'm not really gonna go crazy about it. So the cytoplasm is this jelly-like substance that fills up the cell and that's where everything's floating around on the inside. And he actually does have a job. In chapter four, next chapter, we're gonna talk about one of his major jobs in um, uh, eating and whatnot, uh, In, uh, in digesting sugars and turning that into ATP. So he does have a major job other than everybody floating around in him. So some of the, uh, you know, organelles that I'm gonna touch on real quick, uh, the mitochondria, of course, uh, every cell needs them. Um, they are, I know the internet has spoiled us and said they're the powerhouse of the cell. Sort of? It's it's kind of one of those, you know, those those things that people put out because it's easy to remember, but it's more than that. They are they are epic, like actually they're uh, uh, prokaryotes. They're used to be prokaryotes. Um, they even have their own DNA separate from the DNA that's found in the nucleus, which is actually really interesting. Um, you get your mitochondria from your mother. You actually have to get them from somewhere because they're technically not something that comes with the cell. Um, so if you want to thank your, your mom, if you're still on good terms with your mother, um, if not, don't worry about it. Um, thank them, thank them for your mitochondria because that is where you gave, got your mitochondria from. Um, they actually have mitochondrial DNA and we can test that back to our, uh, through uh, matrilineal lines. There is a concept of the mitochondrial Eve, if you go back far enough with the uh, DNA inside of mitochondria. So it's kind of interesting. Um, so mitochondria, yeah, you get it from your mom. It makes ATP. And we're gonna talk about him at nauseum in the next chapter. So he's one by we're gonna pull up and I know you're all go, there's a powerhouse of a cell. Uh, sort of sort of sort of remember biologists are very picky about definitions for a reason so that's why i say sort of layman's terms yeah that's true scientist terms no not really all right so that's why i say eh, kind of yes and no ribosomes ribosomes are important we're going to talk about them a lot there's these little like granular things hanging out they're all over the rough er right here which is the endoplasmic reticulum and these ribosomes you're going to see them in a video um in a minute it shows the inside of a cell and how everything works and it's really quick and it's really cool and I love it to pieces. Um, and that is all these things right here. Uh, the ribosomes, they make proteins. So they get instructions from the nucleus in the form of RNA that's read the DNA that go out of the nucleus because the DNA stays in there, goes out to the ribosomes and then sits there and reads uh, the ribosome reads that and then turns it into a protein, not the RNA, but literally just it's, that's the instructions. It reads it and goes, oh, okay, and makes a protein. You'll see it in the video in a moment. Um, if you're going, what? Don't worry, I'm gonna show you in a video. A really good one too. Anyway, it makes me so happy. You'll see in a minute. 
Anyway, the Golgi body. Golgi body is right here. It looks like a whole bunch of pancakes. Actually, the Golgi body is just one layer. The whole thing of a bunch of layers is a Golgi apparatus. But like I used to tell my high school students, Golgi is Golgi for our purposes right now. And that is this. They basically, what they do is any proteins that are made inside one cell, but another cell can't make them for whatever reason and needs them, this, this guy is, will package it up and ship it out of the cell. We'll talk about that a little later as well. So... These guys pack it up, ship it out, it's all good. Uh, vesicles. Do, do, do. Where are the vesicles going here? Oh, okay, they, they call it. So vesicles are like storage areas. Um, you'll see vesicles a lot. You'll actually see a uh, motor protein move a vesicle around in the video I'm going to show you, which makes me giggle because it's so funny. Anyway, I know you're like, oh, God, do you have a life? And I'm like, no, really. Anyway, lysosomes. Now, lice means to break down. So lysosomes, and we're going to talk about this guy in the second part of this chapter, because these guys play an important part. They're like the stomach of the cell. So if things come in and the cell needs, it's bigger than what the cell can digest in the cytoplasm, they'll make the lysosome break it down for them. However, sometimes a cell has to die. There are times when cells die and we have to actually tell them to, you know, die. <laughs> and that's called programmed cell death or apoptosis or apoptosis. We'll get into that rant in the next lecture. Um, and um, there's a whole rant behind that. And uh, what happens is the, uh, the cell, if, it, if it's instructed to die, it will actually pop these and all the digestive enzymes will eat up the entire cell and it will break down and break apart. And then a white blood cell comes through and eats up, sucks up the rest of um, the components. You know, like a Roomba, except it's a Selba. That was bad. All right, moving on. Centrosome. Uh, these guys are the centrioles right here. They look like churros. I'm sorry. I still haven't figured out a better way to describe. So books usually go, they look like a bundle of sticks. I, the more I look at them and the more I've seen more pictures, yeah, they kind of look like uh, either... A case fly uh, larva case or a churros? They look more like churros lately. Anyway, um, or maybe I'm just jonesing for some churros. I don't know. Um, but anyway, these guys come into play with mitosis, which is well, something I'm going to talk about in the next little section of this chapter, so the uh, end part. So he comes into play during mitosis. He actually is very useful. He spreads out, and he'll uh, do some really cool things in a bit. But for the most time, when the cell's doing its day-to-day -day job, he's just hanging out, like, in a pair. And there's always a pair of them. And he doesn't turn on until it's time for the cell to split into two new cells. Now, there are cytoskeleton parts. Like I said, it isn't just the stiff cell membrane that actually keeps these guys in shape. There is a cytoskeleton. We're going to see that in the video, too. There's so different types. There's microtubules, there's filaments, there's microfilaments. And it's interesting because some cells, like white blood cells, can change shape and um, on the fly. So they're constantly breaking down these and rebuilding them as they change shape and then move through the body. It's actually pretty cool. Now, some... Uh, cells have cilia or flagella. Um, like the ones that line our esophagus um, actually have cilia. Cilia is like to think of like little hairs. Do not think of them like hair hair. It's a different structure um, from our hair, but it's the closest thing I can think of to explain it without, you know, just go, yeah, it's like hair, but it's not hair. Okay, so cilia is very, very short and fine and it usually moves in a wave pattern. You'll see this in your bronchial tubes uh, to try and collect dust. You'll see this in your intestines to try and suck out a max amount of uh, nutrients. Remember, anytime you see something folded in the body, even in the cell, and this is a major component that I want, you know, a major tip off going from here for the rest of uh, uh, this course and both parts, is anytime you see something folded, that means we need a lot of surface area in a short area. And that's kind of like what this, uh, why the uh, mitochondria has a folded outer membrane and a folded inner membrane. I like to think of it kind of like, you know, how you squish your, um, you have a tiny bag and then you take your, uh, you know, I'm trying to think, hold on, it's coming to me, camping, sleeping bag, thank you. So thank you, brain. <laughs> 
So you take your sleeping bag and you wad it into the tiny uh, bag that it came in. Yeah, uh, same thing here. We want, the folds give us more area in a smaller space. So the more folds we have, the more something can be going on. You're gonna see this over and over again, like in the cell itself with the re, uh, re, uh, endoplasmic reticulum, which is like the highway of the cell. He needs a lot of space to move things around and to make a lot of, and for the ribosomes to make a lot of, um, uh, a lot of, uh, yeah, uh, proteins. Um, same thing with the mitochondria, the inside's all folded and squashed up because we need a lot of area to do the chemical reactions it does to make ATP. Um, and you're gonna see this over and over again. You're gonna see this in your intestines. Uh, that's like uh, crazy folded. If you actually took human intestines and stretched it out, it would cover the entirety of a tennis ball court. So yeah, next time you go to a park and you see a tennis ball court and then you realize that surface area is shoved in your gut. Yeah, pretty intense. Um, You'll see it in your brain. That's why your brain has ridges and bumps, which are called gyri and fucri. Um, other places too. We're going to see this over and over again. So like I said, anytime you see folded membrane, that means you are, are, we need a lot of surface area to do something really important to keep us alive, AKA homeostasis. So that's why you see a lot of folded membranes inside of the cell. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, the nucleus. Now, found only in eukaryotes. You do not find this in prokaryotes because their DNA is all loosey-goosey, although they contain it to one area, but still it's just like out there. Um, we kind of like, we're like Trojan horse in reverse. We keep our DNA inside the nucleus so it can't escape because it's important and we don't want anything to happen to it. These pores on the nuclear envelope, so that's what this is, the nuclear envelope, the skin of the nucleus, if you will, has pores. And these pores are actually only big enough for RNA to get out of, but not DNA. DNA is just like, ah, we're in here forever. So he's hanging out in there protected forever. Now in the middle of the nucleus is the nucleolus because that's not confusing at all. Again, I wasn't there when they named these things similarly just to confuse everybody. But the nucleolus, he actually makes RNA and that's used to be, uh, to do uh, DNA's bidding and go out to the uh, ribosomes to make proteins. And I'll show you that as well in a moment. So remember, humans contain 46 chromosomes. Um, and we're gonna come back and beat that at the end of the next semester. But anyway, in somatic cells. Now, like I said, there's the gametes. The gametes are, you know, eggs and sperm and they're a little weird and they can hang out over there. Actually, I do have plushy versions as well. I have plush, I, almost everything, see? Egg, comes with a little bow and sperm. And then I have a zygote because, you know, you can't, can't have a zygote without a zygote. I've also got a stem cell. We'll talk about him in a minute. Stem cells. And then I have DNA. DNA. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway. Okay, the really exciting video that I love the pieces. So, actually, let me stick it in here because the, this link doesn't work anymore. Although I still love this thing. Yeah, let me stick it here. Watch me edit live. Blink. Insert. Because they, they changed websites on me, which makes me sad. Okay, so I believe it was Harvard Inside Cell. So. Yeah, there we go. No, I don't want, I don't want narrated. Yeah, that's it. There we go. Thank you for coming with me on this editing adventure. Okay, there we go. Again, I'm going to mute this sucker because, um, it's narrated, but I'm not a big fan of the narration. Because this, this video is going to move fast. So, again, oh, oh good, I've got it pre muted. Yay! So, what we're looking at right here is we're looking at like a vein or an artery. These are white blood cells. So, that's what we're going to be going into. 
is this white blood cell right here. Look at him go. Now, again, here's the peripheral protein sticking out of the cells and they're hooking onto each other. So it's like spider cell, spider cell. So again, this is the outside of a leukocyte. This is the inside of, you know, some other cell that's, so again, so there you go. I mean, they even hook onto each other, which is insane, which is proteins. It's all just proteins. That's the thing that kind of, when I say we're mostly made of proteins and water, Congratulations, this is what I mean. You're gonna see this over and over again, all these different little doodads and everything. So we're checking out how they hang out on each other. Now, whoa, check it out. So this right here, these all little heads bouncing back and forth right here. I don't know why it's showing somebody playing piano. Um, these are the tops of the phospholipids. So we're literally looking at the uh, top down of a cell membrane. And as you can see, there's these lipid protein rafts that float around. So, but you can see how wiggly these guys are. Again, without the cholesterol sticking through, which is what this stuff is right here, um, it would just be like liquidy goop. Um, so we do need the, the uh, you know, cholesterol to stiffen it up a bit to make sure it stays in a certain shape. But yeah, these are all the, uh, the hydrophilic heads of the phospholipids. So let us continue. So here is uh, lipid rafts, again, protein sticking out. Lipid raft. And here you can see it just floating about on the sea of lipids, phospholipids. And again, and here's the cholesterol sticking through to stiffen it up. You can see all the tails, the hydrophobic tails here, right here. Pretty cool. They slowed this one down on me. Again, proteins doing things. Do I, do I need to tell you what these proteins are doing? Not really, I don't, this is a receptor. So this could be literally uh, something else. So receptors usually make a trigger change on the inside. Again, we're gonna go over more and more receptors. I'm just showing you things. Now we're going down into the cell. So here we are going through the phospholipid bilayer, which is up above and up. Here's a transmembranic protein. Here's another protein that's sticking down in. Um, Again, we'll see him more when we talk about uh, the endocrine system. A lot of these guys hang out, are useful in those things, how hormones talk. So we're looking at the cytoskeleton here. Here's again, we have these guys again, giving more support to the cell membrane. Kind of cool, very ge geometric uh, life. It's so geometric sometimes, most of the time actually. All right, come on, go down in. Whee. All right, so now we're going to look at a whole bunch of microfilaments. Uh, yeah, these are the actin filaments. All right, the actin filaments, they're going to come back to us later when we talk about muscles. So wait on him. He's coming back later. He's a big player in how our muscles work. He'll be back. Get to the chopper. Wait, wrong movie. So again, we're looking at a lot of uh, cytoskeleton here, but it breaks down and comes back together a lot. So check this out. So here's one reforming, because like I said, they can change shape, the white blood cells anyway. Some of them, not all of them. See, just instantly it's chemistry. Literally what's making these things go together is just chemistry. It's just basic, chem you can do it yourself. Here's, a, here's an enzyme, it's coming up and it breaks it apart and it falls apart. Isn't that cool? So here's an enzyme, that's his job. He's here to uh, attach and break things down. Isn't that crazy? These are cool. So these are microtubules. So again, part of the skeletal system and uh, other, en uh, other enzymes or proteins like to walk up and down the sucker. And you're gonna see him in a minute because he's one of my little favorite guys. So again, they too just break down and cup, uh, put themselves back together, uh, depending on, you know, the cell uh, changing shape, like I said. Oh, here's my favorite guy. This is a motor protein and he's moving a vesicle. So remember the vesicles I said are kind of like containers. So inside here is a, could be a bunch of proteins or uh, anything. And look at him, look at his little feet. This is literally how he looks if we could look at molecules. I mean, look at his feet, they just go. I'm sorry, I get so happy when I see him. He's so happy, he makes me happy. Here's some mitochondria hanging out, these wormy looking things, it's a mitochondria. Yeah, they're moving around inside of you. You know, because they used to be bacteria. Long, 
So here again, here's the centriole or the centrosome. Centrosome is both of them. Centrioles, one, two. Not the centrioles. I had some students used to drive me nuts. You mean the centrioles? <laughs> All right, here we're looking at the surface of the nucleus, and these are the nuclear pores I was just talking about. What's coming out is RNA. So RNA is coming out because DNA is not allowed out. So the RNA is coming out, and he's searching for a ribosome, and that's when he clicks with one, and he snaps together, and a ribosome comes over, and there's this small subunit, and then a large subunit, and then it starts reading the mRNA and it starts producing a protein. This is a birth of a protein right here. So a new protein is being made. And then it breaks off. Sometimes the our ribosomes will read it more than once and make a ton of these. And then the proteins will go off and merge together to create, you know, larger proteins that make us us. Now, a lot of these guys, if they start producing, they'll actually go down to the endoplasmic reticulum. So again, you're seeing the ribosome. But instead of reading it first, it goes and attaches to the endoplasmic reticulum and then basically makes the protein in there. And then the protein then goes through the endoplasmic reticulum. Again, this is a closer look. And then he goes off through the endoplasmic reticulum to be collected into a vesicle. Again, the vesicles are popping off with a whole bunch of proteins that need to be shipped to another cell. And then our friend, the motor proteins back with his little feetsies and he's dragging a vesicle filled with all these proteins that were just made. And they're bringing it, dragging it to um, the Golgi apparatus where the Golgi apparatus will package and, f you know, sort things and figure it out. And then, again, you'll see the vesicles coming up and joining into the Golgi apparatus, and it has several layers, which are each a Golgi body. And um, you'll see the, the vesicles popping off again, and they go up, and here he is bringing them outside to the cell. He's like, come with me, little, come with me, vesicle. With my little feeties, I will bring you to the top of the cell. And it will, the vesicle merges with the plasma membrane and kicks out everything inside of it, which is known as exocytosis outside the cell. Exo means outer, cell means cyto. And we'll talk more about that in chapter four as well. And this is just going in reverse now of everything we just saw on the outside. So again, the receptor thing, this is going to come in later when we talk about uh, uh, definitely uh, enzymes, or yeah, no, hormones, excuse me. G protein, he got, definitely comes in on the hormones. We'll talk about him later, way later. But there you go. I wanted to show you this because I wanted you to kind of see how all these things are actually working in a cell. Again, I view videos as, and hopefully YouTube doesn't tag me on this going, you're showing stuff that you weren't supposed to show. But anyway, it goes back and, and keeps going. We've already seen all this bit. So there you go. Um, that is the inner life of a cell. Uh, no, go back. Continue. All right. So, so like I said, I, I thought I think that video is just worth its weight in gold. Harvard made it uh, years ago. God, I think it's over ten years old now, but it still stands up. It's beautiful. All right. So anyway. So let's talk about how do things move around in the cell? Well, it's it's same as the how things move around around us, really. Um, for instance, diffusion. So diffusion is the net movement of a, a substance, usually a liquid or a gas, from an area of higher concentration to that of a lower concentration. In other words, if you shove everybody in a closet, we all want our own personal space. We want to spread out. Well, gas and liquids want to do the same thing. And it's just like with stinky perfume. I mean, you know that type. Like, I worked with high school students for years, and the freshman boys would, you know, cover themselves in Axe body spray because they thought that was, like, the way to attract the opposite sex. And it's like, no, that's how you gas them out of the room. Um, but you tried telling them that. <laughs> so anyway, nobody, no offense to anybody who still uses Axe body spray. You do you. I'm just saying. I... I was fumigated by my, my boys right after, uh, you know, gym. But basically what happens is, say somebody puts on some perfume um, in one corner of your classroom. After a while, that, uh, you know, that molecule that's drifting in the air will spread out. And then I can smell the perfume, you know, a couple minutes later going, somebody put on perfume. And it's not the one I like. 
I used to have, unfortunately, I don't know why, I, uh, this is probably why I was not as good as math as I thought it was. I had a math teacher in middle school who would put on this perfume. After lunch, I don't know why she'd refresh it, but it would cause a migraine. I, I mean, I'd see her put it on and I just, I just, I was at the back of the class going, yeah, and in about five minutes, I've got a migraine coming on because of the smell of that stuff. It was, I don't know what it was. It was, I've never encountered it again. It was just instant migraine. And if you're sensitive to smells, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, I'm just saying. So basically, the same thing with liquid. If you put a drop of like red dye in water, eventually it diffuses out and spreads out so it's evenly dispersed in the water. And then you, you know, your water is nice pale pink. Now, facilitated diffusion is a process by which the substances are transported by carrier proteins. And sometimes we want it to diffuse, but we want it to go faster. So sometimes we have to send the proteins in to carry it off. Uh, to make it diffuse a little bit faster because we need that. Um, we'll talk about facilitated diffusion later-ish, but we, we only really touch on it here. What I want you to understand is diffusion because diffusion is something that happens regardless, like the perfume in the room um, or other stinky gases that people can emit. Um, flatus, that's the technical term for it. Uh, so basically diffusion happens naturally. Now our body likes to take as much advantage of diffusion as, as possible. So it's not, it, this, this stuff happens on its own and we don't have to waste energy to make it happen, which is kind of like facilitated diffusion. But, um, so we like to, you know, as an organism, save energy wherever we can by not wasting it on things that we have no control over. And diffusion is definitely one of them. We like to use diffusion for our own benefit. Now, one of these things we have no control over is osmosis. Osmosis is the diffusion of water across a semi-permeable membrane. And not just the name of a, a part of the name of a movie that was, like I said, the animated parts were good. The live action made me go, oh God. Anyway, so. Osmosis is diffusion of water across a semi-permeable membrane. And as I was saying earlier, water has, uh, the cell membrane really has no control over this bit. Uh, so what happens is that water can go one of three ways. Uh, if you throw like some red blood cells and you throw it in a uh, salt concentration, there is more uh, water on the inside of the cell than there is on the outside of the cell where all the salt is. And because of that, the water goes right out and the cells will shrivel and shrink. And this is something you need to kind of, uh, especially later when we cover the kidneys, please edit this into your mind for later somewhere, is that water always follows salt. Water follows salt. This is a major thing for kidneys. Um, so that's called hypertonic. So hypertonic, you throw it in a salt solution, it's hyper, all the water runs out like kids on candy going for more candy over here. Whee! And it shrivels and shrinks. Now hypotonic is when you put the water in somewhere where there's a lot of water on the outside and not as much on the inside and like distilled water. That's really, really, really pure. That's pure, pure, pure water. Not to be, you know, don't drink distilled water that can actually dork you up. Anyway, um, but, and this is why, uh, th that's where all the water gets, you know, going into the cells and the cells kind of swell up and go, ah, and burst. And that's called hypotonic, so huge. Hypo, like a hippo, big and round. I'd never want to mess with a hippo. Anyway, so hyper, shrinking, hypo, swelling and bursting, okay? Isotonic is where there's no movement. And that's basically how most cells kind of like it. They're like, yeah. But cells do have to contend with this. Uh, but we try to, again, this is a part of homeostasis to kind of maintain this. So we don't have them shrinking and bursting and shrinking and bursting. Um, hypotonic, another reason you see it is when, you know, you get the wrinkle fingers. You get all pruney from being in the bathtub for too long. Yeah, that's kind of hypotonic happening. So that's why you get all the... The pruny fingers and toes is hypotonics happening. Anyway, filtration is a process by which molecules are forced across a membrane through pressure. Again, we'll come back to the, thing. our friend, the kidneys are big time on filtration. Do, 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 do. Huge. 
all this fun and more next semester with the kidneys. All right, so let's talk about, again, what I was saying earlier about energy. Cells don't want to waste energy. Energy uh, takes a lot of effort to make, and we just don't want to waste it on anything. So if we can be completely and utterly uh, get things done just by basic chemistry without putting any energy into it, our body loves that. Indeed, this has influenced how a lot of our systems work to try and do it as cost effective as possible. That makes us efficient and therefore we're not extinct. Anyway, so one of the ways this is, is uh, anytime we don't use energy to do this is passive transport. Passive transport is basically where the cell expends no energy and just kind of takes advantage of the chemistry that happens naturally. This is diffusion, this is facilitated diffusion, and this is osmosis. So those are the three types of passive transport where we just kind of let chemistry do its thing and we take advantage of that. We don't have to waste any ATP to make it go. I like to think of it like, has anybody been tubing on a river? That's how I kind of see passive transport. We're all sitting in our tubes and we're just floating and we're going with the current of the, uh, of the river. Um, and hopefully you've put on sunscreen because I always get the snot burnt out of myself when I do that. Anyway, is it bacon? No, it's me frying in the sun. Anyway, so passive transport. Think, you know, why we have remotes. You know, you sit up there and you go, you don't have to get up and turn the switch anymore. Or, you know, if you were of the older generation, we make the kids stand up and change the channel back before we made remotes. So, yeah, so imagine it's, it's remotes. Passive transport, we change the channel. Uh, active transport, on the other hand, is where we have to use energy to get something across the cell membrane. And this is kind of like swimming upstream. So if the, uh, you know, if our, my example of, you know, going tubing and we're floating with the river down the river, Active transport would be us trying to swim up the river, kind of like salmon going to their breeding grounds. So we have to use a lot of energy to try and go against a concentration flow. And sometimes we have to do that. Uh, our neurons do it all day, every day. I'm doing it right now just thinking and talking at you. Um, active transport, that's why our brains are so hungry. Actually about, I think 40% of everything you eat literally goes to maintaining your nervous system and your brain. I think it's 40. I'll double check. Anyway, but our brains be hungry, and that's why, active transport, we're always having to go against a concentration gradient, and just like swimming upstream, it's exhausting. We need energy to swim upstream. So, floating down the river, swimming upstream, uses energy. Doesn't use energy. Uses energy. Doesn't use energy. Hopefully you got that one. Okay. Now, as I was saying earlier, when the uh, cell in the movie was popping out all this stuff, that's called endocytosis. So endo means, or it, excuse me, it was popping it out was exocytosis. Well, there's the opposite of that. Sometimes we have to go up and find something that we want. And like, say for instance, the cell sees something and it goes, Wah, and it covers it with its own um, cell membrane and pulls it in as a vesicle. So it actually, you know, swallows it, basically pinches off a bit of its own cell membrane around it, pulls it in, brings it over to the lysosome. Remember I said the stomach of the cell merges all the enzymes inside the lysosome, digest it. We suck out what we want, keep the waste in the uh, vesicle, and then kick it out in exocytosis. So endocytosis is moving a large substance into the cell via vesicle, punching off a vesicle around it. Now there's different types of this. There's pino. Uh, cytosis, which is liquids, there's phagocytosis, which is solids, and there's receptor-mediated endocytosis. In other words, there's a protein hanging out here, and he has to be triggered before it will even do this. That's what receptor-mediated endocytosis means. So he, somebody on the surface has to get triggered, kind of like somebody flipping a switch, and then he goes, oh, okay, and then he eats it. So hopefully that makes sense. I, I, I like to think like Pinot, like Pinot Grigio, it's a wine. Phago always means to eat. So phagocytosis is solids. Pino, like a wine liquid. Uh, anyway. Now, exocytosis. Again, I, was, I, said, I mentioned that where you saw it all going out, like the vesicle merges with the cell membrane and it kicks it all out. That was exocytosis. So the movement of large substances or a whole bunch of waste or proteins getting kicked out of the cell. Then there's something called transcytosis. Now, this is something we're going to talk about 
again in chapter five because there's certain ways cells are actually melded or welded together to make just because you're thinking, okay, all these cells, how do they stick together? I will talk about that in chapter five. That's coming. However, between cells, sometimes they have a rapid transport system between them and it makes, if you trigger it, it gets uh, something from one end of the cell to the other end of the cell really, really fast. It's kind of like, you know, those Japanese um, super fast trains, those maglev trains that go wee. Um, so imagine that. So we have uh, like a super train fit system. It's called transcytosis. So you get in and you go wah to the other end really fast. However, sometimes some things can use that against us, which would be HIV. HIV is a sneaky snot, and he actually will trigger ex, uh, transcytosis inside a cell so he can travel faster through it. Sneaky, sneaky. Mm. So this one we like because it's fast transit. If we need something from one end of the cell to the other end of the cell, like pronto, uh, we can do it. However, like I said, some diseases get in and use it against us. So little sneaky snakes. All right, so again, here is, um, if you need to go back over it, he goes over uh, membranes and transport really well. Again, it's a, you know, uh, basically how we use chemistry and energy as efficiently as possible. So highly recommend, like I always do, watch yourself a uh, good crash course if all of this is going well. All right, with that said, we are done with the first half of chapter three. Yay! Next up, uh, I'm going to come back with you, or to you, or something like that. Some words, insert here. And we're going to talk about uh, mitosis in the second half, uh, apoptosis, and cancer. So I'll see you in the next bit. See ya!